Welcome to The Voice of America. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. You have studied the use of internet and social media in Central Asia. And based on your research, how connected would you say the region is to the world today? Um, well, that really varies country by country. Um, there's different penetration rates for each state. Kazakhstan's is much higher. Um, Uzbekistan's is about, I think, around 20%, um, but it's rapidly growing, especially within um, the last five years. And um, Kyrgyzstan's is relatively high. Turkmenistan is very low. Um, Tajikistan is, is also very low. The Uzbek government recently um, released a statement saying that almost one third of the country is now online. I mean, would you say that is close to reality? Um, I really wouldn't know. I don't have additional information. Um, I wouldn't necessarily challenge it. I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that that population is likely very urban centered and so you're going to get a much higher you know, percentage in cities and I don't think it's evenly dispersed throughout the country. But I've noticed a growth in um, Uzbek language media um, and, and in the number of Uzbeks using services like on the Klasniki or Facebook or other social media networks um, since around like 2008, 2009. Our research shows that um, a lot of people access internet on their cell phones. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, media are increasingly relying on that fact that the majority of people have cell phones. Right. But how much of them are really going online to seek information? I think that's very hard to tell, um, particularly for a country like Uzbekistan, where people might be, you know, reading information, but they're not necessarily participating in forums or discussion of the information that they read. Um, you know, you can look at a website like uh, Forgana.ru. You'll see an article um, that, you know, in the comments section, people will comment and other people will say, don't comment on this issue. You know, the uh, National Security Services is reading this, and then someone will say, oh, no, you're really from the National Security Security services. So there's all these, you know, sort of layers of suspicion and duplicity and people not wanting to be implicated in reading content that they are um, forbidden to read. A lot of obviously critical sources of information are blocked. Mm -hmm. um, yes, RFRL exactly. um, is blocked. Right. BBC is blocked. Um, right. Voice of America is blocked. Fergana. The government seem to be very proud of the fact that a lot of people are online, that, you know, that the societies are developing, that the modern technology is coming into the lives of people. But at the same time, we have blockages. Right. I mean, I think that's kind of um, in keeping with their policy on a lot of political and social issues where if a problem exists, they don't necessarily want to address it publicly. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's not something that they're going to discuss. Um, it's been, you know, tested, though, by people who have gone to Uzbekistan and tried to access these sites. Um, you know, there there have been pictures of signs from internet cafes saying visiting certain sites, including um, Fergana.ru, is forbidden. So I think there might not be an official policy or a statement of policy, but I think within um, these cafes, you know, the owners of whom are accountable to the government if they allow people to go on forbidden websites, it's, um, you know, more open. And, I, you know, and I think it's true that, you know, technology is developing in Uzbekistan. More and more people are going online. And, you know, that is, that's a great potential thing, but, it, you know, it's unfortunate that people aren't able to get the kind of information um, they might want to see or at least be exposed to different um, points of view um, with all that new technology that's available. We know that Adnan Klasniki is the most popular social network and then Facebook is also increasingly becoming popular and a lot of people get on them because the application is available on their cell phones. Right. Um, you know, seeing how popular were foreign social media getting in Uzbekistan with the initiative of the government, they launched um, a series um, of websites, if you remember, right. Molokot.uz. <laughs> um, do you think that has had any kind of an impact? Well, I don't know because I can't go on Moloko because I'm not an Uzbek citizen. And, you know, that that's the goal of it is to create a network, um, you know, for Uzbeks only. I mean, I think in part to monitor, you know, what kind of um, conversations people are saying. But I think also to just kind of deter people from using these other social networks um, where you can have exposure to, um, you know, a lot of either foreign information or honestly, I think um, information written by Uzbeks in the diaspora in Uzbek language that, that the government wouldn't want them to see. From what I've heard, um, Mulakot's traffic is very low, you know, compared to on the Klasniki or Facebook. I don't think, um, you know, it, it's, it's an especially dynamic site for online social interaction for Uzbeks. The advocates of Mulakot.uz, they say that, well, we need to have something in our language. We need to send our to set our own trends, right. our o own internet lingo. You know, we need to learn how to communicate within ourselves. They know, obviously, that there are restrictions on right. it, but... Um, a lot of young Uzbeks seem to be liking it. 
that right. there is a specific Uzbek language social network. Right. Well, I mean, I think that that's a great idea. I think you know, I think it's wonderful if there's an Uzbek language social network. I wish there were more online tools that were in Uzbek language, things like Google Translate or, or stuff like that. Um, you know, so that Uzbeks have more opportunities to use this sort of technology. Um, you know, the thing is though is that it it creates an artificial division between Uzbeks in Uzbekistan and Uzbeks in the rest of the world. Um, you know, because those Uzbeks can't go on a network like Mulako. You know, basically turns it into state um, sanctioned, you know, or state property. Um, whereas, you know, on, on a network like Facebook, which while it's a private corporate network and has its own set of problems, at least there, Uzbeks, you know, living throughout the world can can speak to each other and interact directly. You know, and also Uzbeks from neighboring countries, um, you know, who, who speak this language and often in a country like, you know, Kyrgyzstan don't necessarily have the opportunity to, to interact um, quite so dynamically in their native tongue, um, have the opportunity to, to speak online freely. We constantly talk about the lack of debating culture, not just in Uzbekistan, but across the region. Right. That people are not very good at expressing themselves. They have a lot to say, but they are not used to sharing it right. um, you know, with others. Do you think that social media, I'm asking this question because I know that you follow a lot of uh, what goes on on right. the web. Um, do you think that the social networks specifically have helped that culture to develop? Do you feel like Central Asians are more willing to debate with each other? I mean, it, it, it's hard to say because I think there are problems in online communication that, that span every culture. You know, there, there are trolls and there are petty fights and things like that in English, in French, and in Uzbek. And, you know, you see this sort of gossip and, and you know, bad things happening. And that, that has nothing to do with a particular culture or group of people. That's just a kind of quality of the internet that we're all struggling um, how to deal with it. And, you know, issues like anonymity are problematic everywhere. Um, but I would say, you know, they're more problematic in a sense for people from um, Uzbekistan with a, a repressive regime um, where people are more worried for good reason about surveillance and about trust and about you know being punished for what they're saying and so you know like I said there's there's a culture of censorship that leads to online self-censorship and to suspicion of what other people are really trying to do um, when they write online that said um, you know one of the things that I really have enjoyed um, about the internet you know as somebody you know who studies Uzbek and really struggled in America to find Uzbek language texts is that there's just such a wealth of information in Uzbek available you know there's there's poetry and articles and intellectual thought in Uzbek language and so you know the internet is really you know a gift in this sense for somebody who wants to learn um, you know more about Uzbekistan and about Uzbek culture well it is fascinating to really like stand there and watch how people talk to each other online of course there are a lot of people who are nasty who get right. very angry about anything let's say about Uzbekistan about their motherland right. and then there are others who come in and say hey you know let's listen to each other right. let's debate with each other um, in my conversations with the Uzbek experts, um, some of them are not at all, um, you know, interested in what goes on online because right. they think that it's really diminishing the mentality and that it's not helping people to know more or to educate them, to, to make, to enrich their worldviews. But then there are some other uh, Uzbek actually Central Asia experts who say, let them have it, yeah. let them talk to each other. No, I mean, I, I think it's kind of, it's the same as anywhere else. You know, you'll find people who, who are obnoxious on the internet and you'll find people trying to have a productive conversation. And, you know, there are definitely a lot of really interesting conversations being had um, on the Uzbek language internet about all sorts of topics. You know, it's not, there's nothing particularly unique about it except for the fact that a lot of those topics are censored in Uzbekistan. And so the internet becomes kind of the only place where people can have a, a public debate, you know, and it's not like people don't talk talk about these issues privately in Uzbekistan, but there's not this sort of open forum. And in that sense, I think anonymity can sometimes be good online for Uzbeks because it offers this protection. It offers people the ability, you know, even to just ask questions, which I think is something that maybe is used more frequently. You know, there's not as much outright debate, but you see a lot of inquiry about sensitive topics like, you know, religion or, or politics. And it's not inflammatory. It's just kind of people want information and they're either unable to get that information or kind of afraid to ask about things because they don't want to be seen as, you know, like asking about an inappropriate topic. There isn't much coverage of Central Asia or Uzbekistan in Western media. Um, Western media seems to be very focused on domestic right. news. Um, and unless it's really relevant and has some kind of an impact, they don't really talk about Central Asian um, right. countries, societies, or governments here. So Internet is really the, the main source of information when it comes right. to the region. Um, how well do you think Americans know 
about the region today. I'm not asking about politicians or policymakers. No, no, That's a different well, topic. Too. <laughs> and I know you operate out of Missouri. Right, right. I, I mean, my fellow Missourians, Uzbeks accepted, um, don't really know much about Central Asia. I mean, and that's true for most Americans. And, and like you just said, it's a consequence of it not being covered in the news. When it enters pop culture, it, it's usually in like a really stupid or stereotypical way. I mean, not even stereotypical because they don't even get the stereotypes right. You know, they show people wearing turbans and they say that it's, you know, Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan. Like they, they can't distinguish one country from the other. People don't know the history. Um, some still associate it with the Soviet Union. They don't understand that these are, you know, independent states with their own traditions. And so, yeah, media coverage is very poor and it tends to only kind of, um, you know, they only cover the countries and something really terrible happens like in, in southern Kyrgyzstan in 2010. But then you get, you know, all sorts of ridiculous statements um, from the media. And so, you know, one thing I've tried to do personally is somebody who's an academic, but, I, you know, I also write for a general audience and I try to make this accessible because I don't think there's anything particularly exotic or difficult or obscure. I mean, I think it's it's important that all areas of the world are, are covered, and so I try to make you know Central Asian affairs a little more understandable for somebody who who doesn't have that background. Most of the criticism about what Americans say, specifically experts say, about Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, usually is met with something like, "Well, they don't really know much about us. They don't understand our mentality. They don't understand the political." complexities of this region. Um, what would you say to them when you are one of the people they criticize? <laughs> right. I mean, I, I think I do understand the, the political complexities of the region. You know, I also understand and have sympathy for people who are working in a, either in state-sponsored media or for the government that they have to represent that point of view. I mean, I, I don't fault them. You know, what I wish could be possible is, a, you know, an open dialogue and exchange of opinions. You know, a respectful exchange where we, we understand we're coming from different perspectives because, you know, I, I think that that's, that's the best way to go. And, you know, I, I like to read the state media. I like to see, you know, what, what they say is going on. I, I think it gives insight. And so, you know, um, in a certain sense, I agree. I think people from the West, you know, should do maybe a little less talking and more listening on Central Asian issues. But I think who they should be listening to are, are all Central Asians, including, you know, not just state representatives, but people on the ground. Because I don't think we have um, a rich understanding sometimes of what's going on. But that's a consequence of it being a very insular, closed state that often, you know, censors events and information. And do not let people from outside come. Yeah. I mean, how about access? Well, yeah, the access is very difficult. Um, you know, I certainly cannot go to Uzbekistan anytime soon. Um, you know, many Western organizations have been kicked out. Um, they've been reticent about issuing visas to people who have studied political topics. Um, they've ended cultural exchange with people from Uzbekistan to the West, um, you know, which I think is really terrible. And it's just become difficult. And that's why I think that they're so anxious to censor the Internet, because the Internet is much more difficult difficult to control. You know, they can control who gets in and out. You know, recently they ramped up the exit visa um, requirement to keep the people who go back in. Um, but they can't really do that in terms of technology. And, and like you said, with social media, um, I think that's a particular challenge because while well, you can censor an individual website, if you're on Facebook, um, you know, and you subscribe to like Radio Free Europe updates, you'll, you'll get those little glimpses of information, at least in, you know, in headlines and in paragraphs and in the discussions on there. So the censorship um, um, is, is not very successful when it comes to social media. One other criticism that I hear a lot from uh, the officials in the region, not just Uzbeks, but also Tajiks and Kyrgyz, um, they, they think that American media, American experts tend to think on problems only. They, they, they just so blinded with certain issues that sell well in Washington right. and they ignore all the other good things um, that are happening in the region. I think the most popular issue is really military ones or terrorism and I think that's because the American press has to sort of justify to its audience, you know, why do we care about Uzbekistan and we care because you know, there's a military agreement which I, I guess is fine. I think there's other reasons um, to care about Uzbekistan, um, both good and bad. I mean, I, I think it's important that the child labor issue is covered. I mean, that's something that I think Americans would care about. You know, people care if they're buying their clothing from Gap or Jimbery, and that is coming from Uzbek cotton that was harvested by children. I mean, I think people have an interest. Um, in terms of not covering the positive things about Uzbekistan, I mean, I think, you know, <laughs> occasionally there is. There's an interesting little HuffPost um, advertorial for Gulnara's Fun Forum. But I mean, I, I think what I would like to see is um, 
you know, the, the good things about Uzbekistan acknowledged because I think that if you look at some of the things that are really um, wonderful about Uzbekistan, like the high rate of literacy, of educated people, you know, you have, you have this country that's just full of, you know, young, talented, ambitious people. And what I think is so unfortunate is they don't have the opportunity to pursue their goals and ambitions under this government. Um, and I think maybe if people realize that there is, um, you know, this, this pool of, um, you know, educated, interesting youth out there, then maybe more opportunities could be created for them. Maybe um, you know the, the government would be more um, you know willing to uh, bend on certain issues. I know you interact a lot with the young people um, in the region, specifically those in Uzbekistan. What would you recommend the U.S. government do to help them? I think that. It if possible, it would be good if these educational exchange um, things, things like the Muskie program or um, Fulbright were reopened. I actually just heard that. I think Fulbright um, to a limited degree is going to be. It's coming back. Yeah, it's coming back. And, you know, I think those are apolitical programs. I don't think there's anything really for the government of Uzbekistan to be worried about. I think that it's a mutually beneficial relationship where people, you know, they, they complain that Americans don't know about Uzbekistan. Well, if, you know, you give them the opportunity to study there, then, then they can learn and, you know, and vice versa. I think Uzbekistan have a lot to benefit, you know, to gain from um, education abroad. Um, so that's one way to do it. But I think also, um, you know, there's not the level of interest in Uzbekistan or um, the problems of Uzbek people that I would like to see. I mean, I think the government should be more concerned, not just about things that relate to military affairs or this threat of terrorism, which I think is very overplayed for Uzbekistan, but, you know, about, um, they should ask them, you know, what, what can we do to, you know, to help? Because I see a lot of young Uzbek people with ideas, you know, they're looking for advice or they're looking to express their their opinions or they're looking for funding for their organization, I think there needs to be better dialogue about how to put interested parties together um, to create something positive for Uzbek people. There are some programs uh, in the United States at certain universities which um, focus on Central Asia studies, uh, on Central Asian languages, on Central right. Asian history and culture. You went to one of them. Yes, I did. <laughs> uh, Indiana University. Could you tell a little bit more about that to our audiences because, you know, it, it goes back to that point that we were just discussing, you know, how do Americans know about us and how much do they know about us? Right. There are academic programs that focus on Oh, yeah, on, and those programs are very specific and very... Um, um, intensive. I mean, I have a PhD in anthropology from Washington University, but before that, I got my MA in Central Eurasian Studies from Indiana University, and those are programs that um, you know they very much emphasize language study and language mastery. Um, you can't graduate without having. Um, you know, master to a degree a Central Asian language, meaning, you know, taken several years of it. And so I did that um, with Uzbek. They also give a broad overview of the region. Um, people go into these programs, do so to go into various fields, um, you know, policy, or in my case, I was, you know, going into academia. Um, some have gone on to journalism. So they're useful because, you know, it's expensive to go to Central Asia. It's difficult to get language study. Um, there are few of these programs in the United States. I mean, it's not a common thing to be able to go to college and, and learn Uzbek. And so, you know, those, those programs provide a valuable service for people interested in, in learning more about the region. Well, we can talk a lot about a lot of issues, <laughs> but thank you so much for stopping by. Oh, thank you. Thank you.